Next generation sequencing has led to a deeper understanding of acute myeloid leukemia pathogenesis, resulting in several recent FDA approvals of novel agents. In light of these advances, we have growing opportunities to individualize therapy for each patient. In this OncLive peer exchange discussion, we will discuss new and more personalized treatment options for managing AML and emerging strategies for improving outcomes. We'll discuss key clinical trials and how the newest research will apply to your clinical practice. I am Dr. Harry Erba, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Leukemia Program at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Participating today on our panel are Dr. Jorge Cortez, Deputy Chair and Professor of Medicine in the Department of Leukemia at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Alexander Pearl, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Dr. Dan Pollier, Associate Professor of Medicine and Clinical Director of Leukemia Services at the University of Colorado in Aurora, Colorado. And Dr. Eunice Wang, Chief of the Leukemia Service at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center in Buffalo, New York. So let's get started. And let's start by reviewing the genetic testing that is needed for the optimal care of people with acute myeloid leukemia. Eunice, do you want to take us through some uh, considerations there? Sure, Harry. So as you know, acute myeloid leukemia, or AML, is an incredibly biologically heterogeneous disease. It is a disease of immature myeloblasts, which are uh, prematurely uh, uh, arrested in an early phase and, and don't differentiate. Um, and it is characterized, as we are now being seen in all of the next-gen sequencing data, by an incredible complexity of molecular and genetic aberrations. Um, when we um, look at AML, we used to think of it as a bulk disease with a clonal tumor type, we now know through next-gen sequencing and even single-cell analysis that that's not true. Um, almost every AML uh, genome has uh, mutations involved in it, and some of these mutations actually are incredibly helpful, both therapeutically and, and prognostically. Um, we've also known through sequential analysis from diagnosis, remission, and relapse that uh, the number of clones uh, over time in that AML population can vary over time. We can eradicate some of them with chemotherapy, and, uh, and very frighteningly, we also have development of novel ones at the time of relapse and recurrence. So the mutations uh, that have been identified as, as most prognostic are, are include those that are most prevalent as well as those that are rarer. Um, the most prevalent mutations that we find in AML is really a FLT3, either ITD or TKD mutations, IDH1, IDH2, which is found in anywhere from 7 to 15 percent of AML, DMNT3A and an MT, an MP1, uh, TP53, RONX1, AXL1, and, and many other ones. Uh, it seems like every year there are new mutations being identified, uh, and, and our prognostic system, both through the NCCN and the European Leukemia Net, now lists a multitude of both cytogenetic and molecular aberrations in terms of differentiating between favorable, intermediate, and poor risk disease. Um, and as we move forward, I know we're going to be talking a little bit about how identification of some of these mutations is not only prognostic, but also can be therapeutic. And I think it's important to mention at this point in time that for many AML uh, clinicians, uh, next-gen sequencing using an extensive panel for all of these multiple mutations really is, is becoming the standard of care to allow us to optimally treat our AML patients now and in the future. 